Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Psychology Foundation of Canada webinar. Today, we're talking about, we're providing an introduction to prenatal attachment and bonding. And I'm really excited about this uh, conversation that we're going to have today. Um, it will be moderated by Mary Jo Land, and I'm very pleased to have our panelists, Dr. Noor Zaki, Michael Trout, and Michael Blugerman, who will be joining us today. Um, my name is Mandy Hickman. I'm the Manager of Community Programs and Partnerships with the Psychology Foundation of Canada. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit about the organization before I turn it over to Mary Jo. Um, just so that you know, we will be uh, recording this. So if you uh, want to share this afterwards with your networks, we certainly encourage you to do so. Um, so who are we? The Psychology Foundation of Canada, our mission is to nurture resilience in children and youth, and we do this through the use of psychological science. And our hope is, and our vision is, is that we uh, see a Canada where every child achieves their optimal mental health. Um, so we really do this through um, working with adults in children's lives. We recognize that um, as one of the key pillars of resilience, it is that secure adult. So we equip adults with the, the tools and the resources that they can use to support children and their mental well-being throughout the lifespan. And we've got a number of programs uh, that span uh, critical developmental stages. We start at birth with our program called Make the Connection. And this is all about securing and uh, developing that secure attachment between uh, babies up until the age of three and their parents and their caregivers. So this is very much aligned with what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we move on through into the school years with Kids Have Stress Too and into adolescence with Stress Lessons. Now these programs um, are really focused on helping young people identify what is stress, where is stress in my body, and what can I do about it. Um, this is all about um, supporting uh, young people in life's inevitables, uh, inevitable uh, ups and downs. So um, we're really a matter of uh, about health promotion and supporting um, uh, developing those tools throughout the life. And then finally, we've got a program for adults uh, or a tool, uh, an online tool that is called Stress Strategies. And this is a, um, uh, an interactive tool that uh, adults can use to develop an action plan to um, uh, help to figure out what they can do around the stressors in their lives. So I'm interested, I, I know we're all interested in actually hearing a little bit uh, from, from you today. So can you share with us um, in what capacity are you joining us? So we're, we're interested in understanding whether or not you're a professional that works with children, maybe you're joining us uh, in the capacity of parent or, or maybe you're both. Um, and in particular, we're thinking about um, in the early years or even if you're working with um, uh, families that have yet to, to give birth to their children. So we'll do that poll. I'm really happy to see that we've got um, online, we've got uh, 206 people who have joined us already. So I'm also curious to see who's joined us and from where. So if you wanted to share in the chat, uh, you're welcome to let us know where you're coming from um, and please say hello. Um, I'm also going to encourage you to uh, start to queue up your questions. So if we've, we uh, will have a time for uh, Q&A at the end, so please um, start to put your questions in the Q&A rather than the chat. That will uh, help me to keep track of them um, and we'll come back to them at the end. So uh, I wanna share the results. So we've got 55% of you are professionals that work with children and 40% are, are both. So um, you know, we, we crossed over and that's, that's great to see. Okay. Um, finally, I wanted to talk to you very briefly about our program called Make the Connection. As I mentioned, this is all about developing that secure attachment. Um, we've just recently um, uh, developed a, an e-learning course. This was new for the Psychology Foundation of Canada. And this is a, a course that you can take on your own. It takes about an hour to complete, provides you with a theoretical underpinning of what is attachment, how to develop that, and um, it's really geared towards child-serving professionals. Um, and especially child serving professionals who work with um, children and do home visits. Um, but this is also something that you can do um, if you're a parent uh, and you wanna learn a little bit more about activities that you can do with your kids, um, this is a great one to, to check out. So I'd encourage you to visit our website for some more information on that. 
So now I'm going to introduce our uh, moderator. I'm very pleased to have Mary Jo Land join us again. You might remember that Mary Jo had provided us with a, a webinar earlier in the spring. So we're, we're happy to welcome Mary Jo back. Um, she's also a member of our program committee, the early years zero to three. So thanks so much, Mary Jo, for joining us again. Um, Mary Jo is a registered psychotherapist and she, uh, her focus is on facilitating attachment and resolving developmental trauma in children, especially those who've been in care. Um, Mary Jo has developed a, a guide for parents and uh, uh, parents and adoptive parents who are uh, in care. And uh, this book assists all parents as children journey through the child welfare system. Mary Jo and her husband, Kevin, have five children and five grandchildren and were therapeutic foster parents for 20 years and are adoptive parents. Um, so thanks so much, Mary Jo. I'm gonna turn it over to you very shortly. Um, and I want to introduce uh, Dr. Noor Zaki. Uh, Dr. Noor Zaki is an assistant professor of psychology at the American University in Cairo in Egypt. And we're so happy that you're, you're here to join us. Uh, your, your work mo uh, focuses mostly on prenatal, prenatal and postpartum challenges and uh, research focus on attachment issues, prenatal psychology, the experience of babies in the womb, mother, infant, prenatal, and postnatal bonding and attachment, and the intergenerational transmission of attachment. And just recently, and this is where uh, I think, um, Noor, you came into, into uh, our world, was really on your latest research and, and focusing on how mothers are mothered and how this impacts their own transitions to motherhood. So I'm looking forward to, to learning a little bit more from you today. I'm also pleased to introduce Michael Trout. And uh, Michael Trout is joining us he is, uh, he specialized uh, in infant psychiatry at the Child Development Project, University of Michigan School of Medicine under Professor Selma Freiberg. Michael has been in the mental health field since 1968 and in private practice since 1979. And he is, uh, he is the founding um, director of an institute engaged in research, clinical practice and clinical training related to problems of attachment. And he's the founding president of the Michigan Association for Infant Mental Health and the International Association for Infant Mental Health. And we are thrilled to have you join us today, Michael. Thank you. And last but not least, we've got Michael Blugerman joining us. And uh, Michael Blugerman has worked in the field of forming families through adoption for over 40 years. And as the Executive Director of Children's Resource and Consultation Center of Ontario, he's maintained a psychotherapy practice concerned with families and children for many years and his interest in infant parent psychotherapy and the formation of person relating from early attachment experiences and the functioning of the family environment. And Michael's the former president of Attach, which we're um, very much uh, uh, connected with. And, uh, and he's a lifelong learner and we're so thrilled to have you join us today. Thanks, Michael. So now I will turn it on over to you, Mary Jo. Thank you, Mandy. So, um, one, well, the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a little bit of a conversation and I'm going to start off with some, uh, just, just some few basic questions because this is our first conversation. So I'm going to start off with the question, well, what is prenatal bonding and attachment? And I'm going to give each of you a chance to answer that question. What is prenatal bonding and attachment? I'm going to start with you, Michael Blugerman. All right. So. Famously, someone said that the personality of a child is formed in the mind of the pregnant mom um, after conception. And the in my work, I've dealt with happy pregnancies and not so happy pregnancies. And the, the kinds of expectations, anxious or not, welcome or not, happy or not, are, are formative, I think, in the way that uh, an expected mom anticipates the rest of her pregnancy and welcomes the kid into the world. Okay. Uh, Noor, can you answer a little bit about what, you know, how you're viewing prenatal bonding and attachment? Uh, prenatal bonding and attachment is a big part of the work that I do. I work with preconceiving parents, with pregnant mothers and postpartum as well. So the prenatal part is a really big uh, area that I focus on. And this is a relatively recent concept that's part of the field of pre and perinatal psychology. It's based on the fact that babies are conscious and aware of their environment in utero, which sounds, which sounds like a simple fact, but it really revolutionized how we perceive babies. 
because when we imagine babies in the womb, we usually imagine them to be peaceful, disconnected, unaffected by the world around them, just waiting there to come to life, quietly floating, maybe like an astronaut in space or something. A lot of people envision babies in that way, yet nothing could be further from the truth. The womb is really a vital place for human development. And we're learning more and more about that uh, with research. So babies do have an experience during pregnancy that is stored in their implicit memory and in their body. And it really gives babies a head start when mothers are aware of such concepts and start to work on this connection early on. Um, so when we think of concepts like attachment, bonding, and even learning, we need to start thinking about all of these things as starting well before birth. Because the baby may not really understand uh, the words that you're saying per se, but it's the loving and caring tone that you're using. It's the endorphins, dopamine, oxytocin that is flowing to the baby. It's the feeling of being loved, welcomed, feeling safe in the womb. So prenatal bonding is so much about what the parent can do to connect with the baby growing in the womb. And it's not something that you need to do perfectly or even do all the time, but rather just creating the space for this relationship to start emerging early on. Thanks, Noor. And Michael Trout. I feel compelled to begin by saying we don't know what prenatal bonding is. Uh, we can't prove it. Uh, we can demonstrate it. And we can learn about it from moms and dads. Uh, and that's probably the most important uh, part of the whole thing. The leaders in the discovery, so to speak, that there might even be such a thing, were not us. They were not scientists. They were not even clinicians. They tended to be more midwives, um, birthing coaches, moms and dads talking to each other. And we just began to catch on that this possibly could be important. How it's important, we don't exactly know for sure yet. Um, so much of what we've discovered has been more empirical than predictive. I mean, for example, it seems that moms have a real interest in imagining the baby inside of them. That's not a very brilliant statement, but it's exactly, I think, what we're talking about. And that very permission to imagine the child, not only to imagine what he looks like, which moms have been doing forever, and what his capacities are and what he's gonna be like in kindergarten, but also um, what, what he is like as a human being. Can he love? Uh, can I love him? Is it all right to love him now? Is it all right to tell him stories about what's going on in his world? My husband beat me last night. Dare I let him know that that might be why this morning I'm a little edgy? And if I do, Will that matter to the child? And if I, if it does matter to the child, will that be a bad thing, as some might tell me? Or might it actually be a good thing because it begins the process of this baby and I talking to each other? And that begins the process of our co-regulation, which means that years later, I'm probably going to be more likely to know what he's thinking. When he comes home from school and slams his book bag down on the counter, I'm probably going to be in a better spot to guess what happened. And he's going to be in a better spot to be able to tell me what happened. So in summary, I guess what I'm saying is we don't know so much, but we really know an awful lot. And I enjoy that fact. I enjoy that we don't know. That's the very nature of science, to acknowledge that we don't know and we're trying to find out. And I love the fact that in this particular inquiry, we've been subject to outcomes that we never would have imagined. For example, who would guess that moms would talk more glowingly about their baby if before birth, they talked to the baby? Who would guess that birth itself would be easier, smoother, with fewer cesarean sections and so on, dramatically so, just because moms and babies communicated with each other before birth. So it's a wonderful time to be alive thinking about prenatal prenatal attachment. 
Well, thank you, Michael, because you've led us right into the next question about, you know, what, why is this important? Why are we having this conversation? Why is it important? You've started that conversation about why we need to pay attention. So, Noura, we're going to go straight to you and some of your, your work that you've been doing. Uh, I want to take what Michael Trout is, was just saying and build on that. We are actually a long way uh, away from knowing all the facts regarding prenatal bonding and attachment, but we're starting to understand more, as he was saying. And I want to share with you uh, some research that has been done in this area that shows us really the impact of prenatal bonding and attachment and why is that important um, and why we should actually be paying more attention to it. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Just let me know if, uh, yeah, presenter you can see view. my screen. There you, go. Yeah. you just need to go to presenter view. I can't find presenter view. So it's at your top Just under view, I think. Okay, ah, here, oh, sorry. There we go. All right, can you, can you see it that's, now? Okay. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Okay. So this is a study that used prenatal bonding with 4,350 pregnant women from all over the world. And this was done by Gerhard Schroff, which I heard is joining us today, which is such an honor. Uh, so some of the, the findings that were uh, reported by this study, I'm just, I'll just share them with you. So regarding birth, there was less anxiety and pain during labor for women who uh, started to use prenatal bonding and to engage in a some kind of communication with their unborn child. There was less effort giving birth. There were fewer birth complications. These are really fascinating results. There was a decreased need for obstetrical interventions, a lower degree of birth trauma, a lower rate of C-sections. And I'm going to tell you more about that uh, in a couple of slides. But that's really amazing because that is the goal. Like that is a wonderful goal. And if we can do that by prenatal bonding, then we definitely need to pay more attention to it. Regarding the infant, the baby and the baby comes, um, there was no excessive infant crying for the babies who were part of this study. Babies slept longer and deeper at night. These are, are like dream come true for, for new moms. And babies were easier to communicate with. They showed curiosity and emotional stability. And I want to show you three graphs with some percentages that are really fascinating. So here we're talking about premature birth rate. And it went from 8%, which is the average. And this percentage goes up to 9% in Germany and about 12% in the US to 0.2% in this study with the women who use prenatal bonding during their pregnancy, which is amazing. The second finding that I want to share with you, it's the C-section birth rate, which Michael Trout touched upon. And this went down from 30% to 6%. That's really amazing because that's not only a safer birth, but, but also a less costly one. And postpartum depression. This is one of the most fascinating things for me 19% is the average of women who go through postpartum depression after giving birth. And this went down to less than 1% for the women included in this study and who use prenatal bonding. So if the question is, why should we pay attention to prenatal bonding? My question would be, why wouldn't we pay more attention? Like, why aren't we actually paying more attention to this? Because the results are really amazing. And it's, it, it really shows a lot of potential um, of, of things that we want more of. Uh, research also, also shows that prenatal bonding leads to improvements in the baby's physical development, behavioral characteristics, level of intelligence. It has the greatest positive effect on the development of the fetal brain, especially in the limbic system and the brainstem. Uh, Bruce Lipton, who's at the forefront of the field of epigenetics, tells us that when the circumstances are not experienced to be safe by the baby, the baby's energy is used to survive. So his or her brain is built for protection. But when we bond with acceptance and love and when the baby feels that, the baby is safe enough to put his energy into growth and thriving. And that's another like really important finding uh, related to prenatal bonding and attachment. 
So I can I can go on about this for quite some time. I don't want to take uh, <laughs> a lot of time, <laughs> but there there is a lot to be said about why this is important. Really. Well, we'll let Michael Trout add some comments to what you've been speaking about, Noor. Maybe I'll just uh, address um, a little bit about why these wonderful things that Noor just talked about seem to happen. And of course, again, this is science, so by definition, we don't know but what a joy to explore. So one of the things we've discovered, we knew, we've known for a while that something we call maternal self-efficacy in infant mental health research was related to reduction in uh, perinatal depression. We didn't know that helping a mom learn how to talk to her baby and helping her imagine that she could hear the baby talk back to her improves maternal self-efficacy rather dramatically. Now, it doesn't even take a rocket scientist to imagine, therefore, that a mom heading into birth with a high sense of, of self-efficacy, that is, I've got it, I can do this, I know my baby, oh, my baby and I have talked this over, we know what we're doing here, that that might make the birth outcome better. It seems to be almost, this whole conversation um, seems to be almost entirely about that, that when the channels of communication are opened up, when the baby has somewhere to go, when he's worried, and when the mom has someplace to go, when she wants to tell the baby something, it changes the baby and the mom and the connection between them. When my youngest son, who's now in his 30s, had experienced the death of his twin right next to him in the uterus, he had no place to go. We didn't know about this all those decades ago. We didn't know that we could talk to him about the fact that his sister had died. And um, we didn't even really know for sure, I hate to admit this, that it was important. Uh, we've only learned that over the, in the years since then. But that, that stuckness that my youngest son experienced with that death has remained with him all these decades later. And I know both his mom and I wish somebody had told us we could simply have a chat with him about it. We, it turns out moms who are, uh, are, who are instructed that the cord is wrapped around the baby's neck have an option. It's not guaranteed, but it's possible that a mom can talk and a dad can talk gently to the baby about what's about to happen, about somebody's hand going up inside there in a minute and seeing if they can finagle some way to get that cord off. And he needs to lie quietly so that that has a better chance of being successful. What a, what a potential this now is. But that's why I think it's important. Michael Blugerman? Well, I'm thinking listening to Nur and Michael that the, uh, the word that's coming to my mind is embodied. That we are stuck in the science development of this because we don't really understand embodiment. And we think about, we think about individual people as being alone in the world, growing from infancy to adulthood without the environment. And our whole medical, mental representation of that is this individual alone in the, um, the warrior's journey in the world. The, um, the questions like, when does the baby start to exist? Is the baby another person? And all that kind of stuff uh, contradict our understanding and, and make it impossible to do good science and good research. The fact is that the mother-child unit is a biological chemistry embodied connection, mental and physical, and it's not separable. And to think of it from a separate point of view just makes us crazy. But if we think about talking to a kid, relating to a child in our tummy, the, the whole thing, the, the even from the father's point of view, that he's a partner in this project with the pregnant woman. Whether it changes internal chemistry, hormones, all the kinds of stuff that Nora was talking about, makes a huge difference. And I think we have to come to understand that this is a, uh, an environmental process that res may result in an individual person one way or another. 
but it very much is an environmental collaboration from the day one. Noor, I'm going to come back to you um, and, and just to, to get your comments on some of the things that Michael and Michael have been saying. Um, I definitely agree with all that is being said, and I want to take that further to um, it's not only about the experience during pregnancy and childbirth and all of that, which is really important, but it's also about uh, parenting in the womb, making it easier to parent the babies once they're born. Because as we've already mentioned, once the baby comes, it feels as if you already know the baby. There is some kind of connection, which makes it um, soothing is easier. The nervous system of the baby is calmer. Att attachment is strengthened. So all of these things are, are really important. And then if we look at it from an attachment perspective, prenatal bonding is really the first and the earliest bonding experience that we have. So it highly contributes to our internal working model of future relationships. And I, I want to uh, use a quote said by David Chamberlain, which is, who is one of the founders of pre and perinatal psychology. He says, the womb is a classroom and every child attends. And if we really think about that, we we are we were all in the womb and we all learn something while we're there so significant amount of learning happens in the womb and we really should be paying more more attention to that thanks so we know we know what it is we know it's why well, it's important we've had a little discussion about that so let's talk about let's talk about what we can do as parents as professionals to support prenatal bonding and, and attachment like what how can we enhance it um, what are the tips and strategies that we could offer to share with uh, families who are expecting a baby and I'm going to start with uh, Michael Trout there well I, I should mention that that there this answer has to be at several levels there is a specific uh, facilitation it's not a clinical intervention at all it's just a simple facilitation of prenatal bonding that has been developed from those studies that now are mentioned earlier of those 4,350 women uh, that Gerhard has reported on. And that facilitation is not all that we're talking about here. And I don't want to direct us over onto that area, but just parents need to know and clinicians need to know that such a thing does exist, a formal patterned way of improving this experience. But what parents can do right now, and I'm convinced that midwives and counselors and coaches and others can help parents do, are the very simplest of things and the things that probably many moms and dads would do intuitively if they thought it was not crazy or dumb. And the first of those is simply to listen. And imagine that it actually matters to listen. Listen to what the baby is saying. If, if you're feeling uh, blue today or puffy today or nervous today and you wonder why, ask your baby. And then listen carefully for an answer. And then tell your baby what your take on the matter is. You might say, ha, huh, I got up this morning thinking about my dad, sweetheart. I never told you before, I guess, that my dad died during the pregnancy for me many years ago. Hmm. So I never had one. By the way, you're going to have one. I got you a good one. And actually, he's right here next to me. And you're going to meet him pretty soon. In fact, would you like to meet him right now? That's the kind of conversation it's possible to have. And you can even go carry that conversation on to later conversations. You might refer back to it and say, you know what I told you about my dad? Some days I think about him and I just miss him so much. And if on those days I seem a little less here for you, even though you're right inside my belly, but if I seem less here, that'll probably be why. And I'll try to own up to that so you know what's happening. So number one, listen um, and talk, but listen mostly with the imagination that oh, there really is a communication coming from inside there. Second thing, there are lots, but these, these are the only two I'll speak of. Tell stories. It's a great way to practice talking and listening, 
but it's also a great way to create a shared narrative with your baby so that you you sort of um, diagram and describe all through the pregnancy stuff that's going on in the kitchen, but also in the uterus and also in your mind. You begin to tell stories together and maybe you even listen to whether your baby has a take on any of those stories or has a story of his or her own. Uh, I, I guess I already mentioned my son, the twin, but I, I, I'll just say, imagine that. Just imagine telling stories to your surviving twin about what just happened and what, what's likely to happen next. And one of the most wonderful things that can happen to any mother baby pair or for that matter, father baby pair is that after the birth, they already have a shared narrative, meaning they've been through something together and they have a, a common take on what it was. That tends to set a pattern in place for that mother and father and baby to be able to talk with each other about a lot of things that happened as if they are all shared narratives. So, so Michael, one of the things that I hear you talking about there is mentalizing, developing the skill to mentalize because our infant comes out not being able to talk with words. But we, you're talking about already practicing mentalizing the internal experience of the child before the child's even born. And then, and then as the child becomes closer and closer to, to delivery date, those words really do matter. And the sounds of voices really do matter because they can hear them and they can hear those words. Quick story, if we're telling birth stories, my firstborn son, only his head has been delivered. His father says, Eli. And he just like, whoa, turned around and looked up and right into his father's face because he was already had a name, right? And it was like, he's only his head is delivered here and he's just responded to his name. It was, it was really amazing to us. Yeah. So I'm gonna to go to Michael Blugerman. Well, I, <laughs> uh, I, in a weird way, Michael's comments have triggered something in me. I have to say that um, <clears throat> it's important to not feel alone. What I mean by that is that the baby is with you, even if we think of it as a fetus, you're not alone. This person, this child, this fetus, whatever, is with you. And I think I think it helps to establish this connection with other people externally and help them help you welcome this child into the world. There are a lot of women in pregnancy who get very self-centered and in a private kind of way. And I would encourage them to reach out to family, friends and others and help celebrate the pregnancy, help celebrate the arrival of this child. But to take what they say in the grain of, with a grain of salt, people are gonna to respond to you from their point of view with uh, old wives tales, with family stories, with their personal experience, which may be satisfact satisfying or not which may be against your grain, but it's important to share this arrival with as many people as possible and remain connected. And if you remain outwardly, outwardly connected like that, there's a good chance that your respect as a, as a, let's say a steward of this child entering the world, that you're gonna bring this child not only into your life, but into the community that you're part of. So now, Michael, I have to tell you a story. I think my, you know, Michael commented when we started that my hair looks green. It, it may not be green, but I have crazy lighting in my office, but it's gray. It means I was born a long time ago. And my mom thought she was having twins. <clears throat> At the time of delivery, it, it, it turned out that the other person was in fact a large fibroid tumor. She had planned on calling that kid David. I can't tell you how many people through the course of my life have turned to me and said, David, what do you think about this? And I think, well, this is, you know, I've heard about ghosts in the nursery, but I've never heard about ghosts in the womb. So um, I thank you for that uh, little inspiration, Michael. <laughs> Put me on a little trip here. Welcome back from your trip, Michael. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> 
Okay, Noor, we're going to go to you now and we're going to talk about some practical strategies and tips for enhancing prenatal bonding and attachment. I'm glad that the question includes parents because in the beginning you mentioned how parents can enhance this prenatal bonding and attachment because sometimes we only focus on the pregnant mother and we forget the father or the partner and it's really, it, it shouldn't be the case. There are many people who can be involved in prenatal bonding and attachment just like Michael was mentioning. And in my opinion, the best thing, uh, one of the best things that can be done prenatally besides shopping and preparing the baby's room and all of that, which are really important things, but to create a healthy womb environment for the baby in which the baby can feel safe and secure. And sometimes this entails resolving some of the woman's own childhood history if some work needs to be done there. Because sometimes when the woman has uh, some adverse childhood experiences or maybe she experienced prenatal trauma herself or she had previous miscarriages or many things that can happen, sometimes her ability to bond with the baby is, is challenged and sometimes that needs to be worked through. Uh, so I would say one of the first things that needs to be done is to really work on yourself if some work needs to be done there uh, and your relationship with your partner because these eventually affect how we bond with the baby. And so just taking good care of yourself physically, emotionally, nutritionally, all these things that we know about. And then being mindful of the baby's experience in the womb. Like we have been talking about the baby having an experience, but really being mindful of that. I call it having a conscious pregnancy or, or having a mindful pregnancy. And it's just a certain level of awareness that the baby is sharing whatever is going on with me. Um, and this does not mean that the woman is not going to experience any stress during her pregnancy because that's not even realistic. And it's not really, this knowledge is not intended to, to induce guilt, pressure, or to be some kind of burden on the mom, but really to be empowering, just to know that we have this type of impact that we can have on the baby very early on and to have this type of awareness. So like Michael was saying about talking to the, the, the baby about um, my dad this or my mom that, also, after having a stressful day, for example, just to settle yourself and talk to the baby about what's going on. So we say, today has been a difficult day for me. I feel anxious, but I want you to know that this has nothing to do with you. It's not your fault and I'm working on it. Sometimes this is just a very simple thing that we need to do. And it settles the woman, not only the baby, but it also settles the woman's nervous system. So just basically slowing down and taking the time to connect with the baby in a very, fast-paced word that we we live in uh, so yeah there are many things that we can't control in our pregnancy but I think this is something we can do we can slow down and tune into the baby's experience and there are many many ways to do that Noor oh sorry go ahead Michael I just want to comment that I think Noor just gave a marvelous example of what Winnicott meant when he described the good enough mother and you, if people were really listening, they got that you didn't say the mother needs to not be anxious. You just said the mom might want to say to the baby, I'm anxious and that's what's going on and I'm working on it. That's a good exactly. enough mother. Yeah. I, I believe that pregnant women shouldn't be too worried about being worried because that really puts a lot of pressure and burden on the woman. And it's not realistic to be stress-free for nine months. Stress is going to happen and you know, bad days happen, but the whole issue is about how you communicate to the baby and how you explain to the baby what's going on. And it's actually healthy for the baby to be exposed to different types of feelings and emotions because that's life. Stress happens and then there is happiness, love, nurturance, all these things happen. And for the baby to know that it's okay and we can settle back and we can work through these feelings. That's a healthy thing that the baby can be exposed to. If we just back up just a little bit though, um, I just want you to, uh, Noor or Michaels, um, you know, when can a baby hear? When can a baby feel the touch of the mom? When is the mom's um, uh, chemistry of emotion and stress or happiness 
uh, transmitted to the baby. So when gestationally are these things coming online? Because you're talking about talking to a baby. Well, you know, maybe some people don't even know that the baby can hear those words. The baby can hear your voice, not just the conduction through the body, but actually with their ears going into their auditory system and their brain. So maybe we could just talk a little bit about the developmental trajectory of those things. Well, I don't mean to make too much of a shortcut here, but note that Michael Lugerman just answered this marvelously a little while ago when he talked about the organism that is the mother baby together. And so such questions as when can the baby hear, if we mean by that in the adult sense of hearing with these things and processing with this thing, uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. Because the interaction in, inside this organism is what's really what's most important. In other words, I like that things, answer. Hearing the yeah. mom's endocrine system. Yeah. Yeah. The so hormones I just are two, flowing. The chemistry is there. Yeah. Two, two things. The, the mother's capacity, capacity to symbolize, like to put her thoughts and feelings into words, is worth it, regardless of who's, quote, listening. But the other thing is, part of language is the emotional bandwidth or carrier that goes along with the words. And if, as the mom speaks to a kid, whether you, you actually talk in, in uh, loud or whether you write a journal as you're keeping the kid in mind where you're writing and sharing these words, you're sharing emotional feelings that come in as a bundle that the child is gonna decipher chemically, hormonally, or through sound vibrations, it doesn't matter. The message is gonna get across in a significant way. Wow, wow. So I'm, I'm just gonna say we have a few more minutes before we're going to open it up to the q and if, if you, as part of the audience, have a question for the panelists, could you please put your questions into the q and I can see that there are some there already. Um, but we're going to, we want to continue this conversation in a meaningful way to you. So please put them in. Okay, so, so I wanted to just ask a question, first of all, um, about fathers. And um, perhaps I'm going to start with uh, Michael Trout. What about fathers? <laughs> well, Michael Blugerman and I have in common that we're old. <laughs> we remember that when, when fathers not only A, didn't really exist, at least as far as birth and childhood was concerned. And B, they carried some sort of rare uh, dis, uh, disease that meant they had to stay out of the birthing suite, whatever that was. So uh, I'm sorry for the giggling, but that's what I first thought of. Gosh, what a huge change. So all we're left with, I think, is to say the obvious, which is that while fathers don't have the biological connection that Michael Lugerman spoke of a minute ago, they do have, or potentially can have, the connection with the baby that we've spoken about with regard to storytelling and talking and listening. And as your husband could attest, uh, announcing the baby's name uh, to him ahead of time. So it turns out that fathers are ex exquisitely important here and are part of the storytelling that moms do as well. So moms won't just be talking about themselves they'll be talking about their relationship and when father is coming home or that father made this for dinner tonight and boy, I can't wait till you're sitting on the stool there instead of inside of me because you're gonna really like this thing that he makes for dinner on Tuesdays. And it would, may not just be the biological father, it could be the partner of the important second parent. Yeah, Michael Blugerman? Yeah, I think that um that a lot of fathers feel left out of the process because it's such a biological uh, project for the mom and, and the child. But I think the, the partner, male or female, has huge impact on the expectant mom and the kind of conversation, implicit or explicit, that goes on between them and the involvement in that early stage makes a huge difference. Okay, I see that we have 13 questions in the Q&A. So I'm gonna ask Mandy to come back on and um, curate those questions for us, please. 
Okay, um, and I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank you all for this really interesting discussion. Um, I've, I've learned a lot and I can feel the synapses are just firing uh, as, uh, as you're speaking. Um, I'm also excited about what this means for the Psychology Foundation of Canada and I'll let everyone know that this is something that we're curious about. So we do want to hear from you. If you want to learn more about this topic, if you want to see something integrated into our programs related to prenatal, um, please let us know. We do have a survey that we're going to be sending out at the end, along with a list of resources that are going to um, point you to some more research that Noor was talking about. Um, but uh, please let us know. This is, this is how we will uh, learn and grow together. Um, so on to questions. There are a lot of great questions. And so one of, um, referring back to uh, what we were talking about as far as that open channel of communication, there've been a couple of questions related to, does this conversation have to be spoken out loud or can it be something that is happening in, in the mother's head? And how does that um, sort of work with the, with the, uh, the partner? Um, does somebody wanna take that one on? I'm I glad to. Start I'm not the only one again. Now, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I was going to say that actually the awareness of the mom of the baby's experience is what matters the most. So if she feels like talking out loud to the baby, that's good. If she feels like just sending thoughts and messages and love and care to the baby without actually saying that out loud, that's also fine. Because I would like to remind you that it's the um, there is a lot of biology that's happening here and it's the hormone and it's the oxytocin and it's the dopamine and that doesn't have to be out loud. If I'm happy and I feel that I'm in a relaxed state and I am imagining my baby, how the baby looks like and so on and that translates into a positive chemistry in my body that reaches the baby. It doesn't have to be out loud. So both ways can work. It really depends on the awareness of the mother and just her taking that into consideration. If I could just add, Mandy, yeah. um, well, I certainly agree with what she just said, but let's also take note that the act of hearing words activates biology in all of us and the act of speaking words activates biology in all of us. Um, it's one of the reasons psychotherapy happens with words. Sometimes the saying of something is the thing that brings up the feeling about that something. And only thinking about it uh, will not do the same. So how I would, the take I would have on it is, no, of course it doesn't have to be out loud, but does it help? Probably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another question concerning the connection between temperament and prenatal bonding. Somebody wanna to speak to that one? Is that a good one for you, Nora? As I mentioned in the as I mentioned in the research that was reported by Gerhard Schroth, um, the temperament, the general temperament of the babies was easier. The the relationship was smoother with babies after prenatal bonding. Uh, their nervous system was easier to settle down, and just being in a relationship with the baby, and when the baby comes feeling like we already know each other that helps even in with difficult temperament the mother feels like this is a baby i know i know already we have some kind of relationship we can work through things yeah i i would just like to make a point for uh, again not knowing and the the mm. joy of not knowing because because mm -hmm. partly we don't know uh, the, I think the question I even used the word inborn temperament. We're not even sure what that means exactly. Inborn has always meant if it, if you see it at birth, it must be in, inborn. But now we would know, wait a minute, this kid has lived nine months already in social interaction with grownups. Lots of stuff has happened. So how do we know that what we see at birth is all represents inborn traits? what proportion of them might have grown up as a result of interactions uh, in the uterus. The fact that I have lived in a weird kind of shame all my life, always feeling as if I owed something. 
does that have anything to do with the fact that my parents were way too young and there was a meeting in Richmond, Indiana in 1945 to decide should I be kept or gotten rid of long before there was an opportunity to get rid of me legally. I was there for that conversation. And I was experiencing in that conversation, whatever my mom was experiencing about me and about the thoughts of killing me. Does that mean that I was then born with a temperament that included shame? I don't know, but it's sure wonderful and interesting to think about. Yeah. Okay. And and coming. Sorry, Michael. Sorry, I would just like to add that that uh, this uh, prenatal relatedness, I think, can minimize the other that's caused by difference in temperament, and that. Uh, um, as Nura said, you, you already have a relationship. So the difference in temperament won't be as felt as remote or as other in, uh, in meeting the child for the first time in the first months after pregnancy, after delivery. You've got that relationship. That's a really good way to put that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay. So for, for many of us, I mean, we might be exploring this topic for the first time. So I'm curious, we've got a question related to, is it too late to start bonding with your baby by the third trimester if the woman didn't have this knowledge prior to that time? No. It's, it's never too, too late. late. Never too late. Never too late. No. Yeah. Never too late. In fact, it's almost um, a special time, that third trimester, because a great big hairy thing is about to happen. <laughs> And I, and I mean it exactly that way, yeah. that, the, that the mom and the baby might want to have a chat about, which is, mm -hmm. you're leaving. Mm -hmm. And maybe I've got some feelings about that. Maybe you've got some feelings about that. Maybe you'd like to know what you're going to find when you get out here. Maybe you even need permission to leave. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need encouragement to leave. It's a wonderful conversation to have in the final trimester. And, and in the final trimester, there's more physical conversation happening between the child and the parent. The child's moving around, kicking. The mom can't comfortable way to lie down, go to sleep. There's there's more um, volume turned up on the conversation between the child and the parent in that trimester. So with all good intentions to, to have this bonding with your baby before baby's been born, I'm curious about if there's the, any research relating to anything that might limit that um, bonding, for instance, environmental factors or demographics, physical mental health. Do we know anything? Uh, does the research demonstrate anything relating to limitations um, that may inf impact uh, attachment to bonding? Michael First thing that comes to mind, of course, is maternal preoccupation. If she simply doesn't have the energy, doesn't imagine that she has the time, doesn't have the uh, temperament, the proclivity to do any of these things with their baby. In fact, the baby is a little bit of a intrusion on her life, this unborn baby. That's going to be a limiting factor about whether there's going to be prenatal bonding, but also a limiting factor on whether there's going to be adequate uh, bonding after the baby is born. Mm -hmm. Also, when the woman is was exposed to prenatal trauma herself, or she, like I said, she had a, a cha challenging childhood. Um, miscarriages also play a role in that. Sometimes I see that with the women I work with as well. Sometimes when the woman has had a miscarriage or more, sometimes her ability to bond with the next baby is, is diminished or challenged because there is some grief work that needs to be done first um, before she's really able to open up and connect with the, with the baby. I would even go so far as to say that anything that threatens mom's sense of felt power and efficacy is an enemy. Mm -hmm. And that includes 
an, a thoughtless physician or a physician or, well, I'll just make it a physician because midwives almost never do this, who for some reason or another finds it necessary to engage with mother in a power struggle over the birth. That's an enemy to what we're talking about here. And she needs to get rid of all enemies to the, to the, uh, her sense of authority and power. I would just like to add that, you know, our conversation anticipates an intact family with a, a mom, a dad, expecting a child in the best of circumstances. I'm aware that there are many pregnancies that are not planned, that are not wanted, where the mom is a single parent alone in not good circumstances. And in the extreme, uh, women who have been raped in war zones and, and so on, uh, where we, we have less than optimal uh, situations of the kind we're talking about today. So I, I'm not aware of hard research about that, but I, I know that the shame, guilt, the hormone soup that the child is growing up through has huge implications afterwards. Uh, I'll wait for someone else to do the research, but I think that's anecdotally widely known. Um, I think we've got time maybe for uh, for one more question and um, I'm just going to leave it with this and I, I I wanted to hear your answers in relation to how do we know that there is the development of a secure attachment? What are the signs of a secure attachment either prenatally and then once babies uh, in in the world outside of the womb? Well, I, I'll just make one comment and that is that if you do an attachment interview in the third trimester, you can predict the attachment style of that child uh, in, as, as they grow. So the attachment style of the mom in that, in that last trimester of herself and her early family experience is gonna be expressed uh, in the life of that child going forward. So by, extra by extrapolation, I could say, Mandy, that the, the more a parent comes to earn their secure attachment, even in the last trim trimester, the more likely they are to pass on that kind of relatedness that forms a secure attachment with the child afterwards. Mm -hmm. And to put it in really simple Michael Trout terms, it's just about being there. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Um, I wonder if anybody's got any final comments before we uh, say goodbye for today. Noor? Uh, I think we talked about the most important things. Uh, I hope this was helpful for, for everybody. I'm really glad we're starting to have this conversation and I think more and more awareness is needed in that area. So I'm, I'm really glad we started to do that. Michael Trav? I'm just real thrilled and want to encourage all the participants also to be thrilled about the fact that this is not going to be the last they hear about this through the foundation. Um, so I hope you keep directing your questions and your, your uh, inquiries to the foundation. More may happen. Um, and the conversation certainly is a worthy one to continue. No, I would just like to congratulate people who are tuning into this program on your curiosity about this very important subject. And let's keep the conversation going. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And as I mentioned, uh, just on behalf of the Psychology Foundation of Canada, I wanted to thank uh, Mary Jo, Michael, Michael, and Noor for sharing with us today. I do hope that, that we will continue this conversation. I, I know we will. And uh, for everyone else, please uh, be in touch. Let us know. Do you want more of this? What, what else would you like to talk about? Um, so thank you, everyone. And um, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.